that's stuff about me. <laughs> I'll cut through that pretty quick. All right, um, so the deal with this is uh, we as security uh, professionals have a crap ton of tools to deal with on a daily basis. Um, I know that I have, uh, I work in the uh, Virginia Tech, I work in the IT security office there, and we have the Tomb of Software, which is a hundred uh, sleeve DVD case. I'm sure you guys have something similar. Uh, you've got all these bootable tools, all these things that you need for different environments, and it's a big pain to keep up with. Um, you loan them out, you lose them, and um, sometimes you need them, like incident response. You need them right away. So uh, I thought, well, I'd try to put all that stuff together. So what Katana does is it brings um, a bunch of live distributions, like Backtrack, uh, together with portable applications that will run in Windows na uh, from a single USB flash drive. So no longer keeping up with the, the tomb of software and you know, wondering which computer that certain thing is installed on, you can put it all on a single flash drive, keep it in your pocket, very convenient. I'm sorry, it's not showing up in here, it's showing up in there, so I'm, I'm definitely not messing with it. Um, and another thing about USB flash drives, which is a little more convenient than your normal CD DVD, is you can change things on there on the fly. Unlike a CD, you know, you've got that, you can change it, but you have to reburn an ISO, burn it again. Uh, USB flash drive is a dynamic environment, makes things a lot easier uh, for you to modify. CD versus U USB. Um, some of this I've uh, just covered, but uh, a lot of it is, is speed. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to boot a live CD versus a USB version of a live thing, of the same live operating system, but it is way faster. Especially when you're, you know, you're doing stuff and everything's cool and then you click on something new and then just gotta spin up again and find that stuff. It's a lot faster from USB flash drive. Um, two, two of the drawbacks, you can see up there on bold, in bold kind of the things that I deemed to be a benefit for either side. Uh, the one benefit, or two benefits for CD. One, um, a lot, almost every distro, every live distro basically supports CD. I mean, some are just floppy, but that's very old. Um, and uh, the other is um, uh, the BIOS support. Um, if you're working with some older systems, if, if you haven't booted from a uh, USB, the BIOSes sometimes have it turned off and turned on. Most modern BIOSes will support USB boot. Um, I'd say that started in the like early 2000s, but prior to that, uh, they're like, uh, you want to boot from what? No, CD is the way to go. So um, that can be an issue when you're working with some of the older systems. All right, so I mentioned you know I have this grandiose tool suite, and we'll talk a little bit more about what's in there. Um, but I want to talk about who made the cut. Um, it's really hard, you know, when you're looking through all these suites of tools because there's so many and they're so awesome, but a lot of them overlap. So what I tried to do is I didn't, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that these are definitely the best tools, they're just the ones that I found. Um, as I said, the dynamic environment, you can actually modify and, you know, add or remove as you want. Uh, free for personal use. Uh, you that are working in the corporate environments with, back, with um, Katana, you, you need to check the licenses before you use it because um, I was looking at it as, you know, personal uh, fun thing to use all the time but uh, I can't guarantee all the licenses are that. Um, unique, I mentioned that, and currently supported for the most part. Something like, you know, Netcat, which was made a long time ago, works beautifully. I kept that in there because, you know, uh, current support, you know, I, don't know, I don't know when the last time the official version came out, it was quite a while ago. But for the most part, everything needs to be currently supported um, so that you guys can get the, the, new, the best and the uh, brightest uh, new software out there um, to keep around with you. All right, so I have a DEF CON pre-release. Uh, it is available at the Hackers for Charity booth just on the other side of these walls over there all the way to the back. Um, this is the, uh, so it's 2.0. Um, I have a 1.0 and 1.1 release, so if you don't get it there and don't want to like do the dev and the new stuff, uh, you can get it on the website. Um, I, uh, it seems so bad after the presentation today that I have to say that there was, there's a couple of flaws in this release. Uh, that's why I said instead of pre-release it is now officially a beta release um, and I will get into more of that in just a second. So the starting lineup for Katana. Um, this is what I've included by default. Uh, you can really think of that as uh, the default settings. This is what I give you. Um, I tried to kind of get the wide gamut of different kinds of tools that uh, system administrators might use. Um, 
not really f trying to focus on anything in particular. You know, I took backtrack as the pen testing one. I have Kane as the forensics one. Are there other great distros out there? Absolutely. And I encourage you to look into those two. These are, you know, not, these are not, this list is not the only things that do this stuff. But I couldn't include everything because it's already several gig in size and if I gave you a file that was, you know, 32 gig download, I'm sure nobody would ever use it. So this is the default lineup. I'll talk about installing stuff a little later. Here's my epic fail. Second epic fail, apparently. Um, <laughs> backtrack is not working. So it's not the fault of Backtrack. Beautifully. I, I screwed this up. Uh, my thumb drive died on Friday as I was devving. Everything was great. I was all ready to, to make my, you know, I, it's all in the RAR files. I put it ready to put it together, together. It dies on me. My last backup was two and a half weeks prior to that. So I know, and I look, no, lessons learned. <laughs> lessons learned, people. I, I, I had a backup. What does it say? Backup often. Backup the backup. And backup often. Okay, let, let my mistakes, you know, you guys can learn from that. Uh, yeah, so that was awesome. So basically, um, using some of the forensics tools provided, plug, uh, I could not use Autopsy to recover all my files. Very sad. I ran, this is forensics hints for some of you people. Autopsy is awesome. Um, I ran strings against the entire 8 gig uh, uh, flash drive and had to analyze that. So I got a couple of things back, like the, the documentation. Um, and that was really all I got back. So I had to kind of uh, start from scratch ish from that point. So I spent one day trying to recover and then I stayed up for 36 hours basically fixing everything <laughs> that I had done in the prior two and a half weeks. So I apologize for that not working. Um, if there's any other bugs, especially if there's misspellings, I just kind of, it, there's new features and the stuff should work and I tested last night. It, it seems like all the other operating systems are working fine but uh, that particular thing, uh, epic fail on my part. However, there's a simple fix. You don't have to do anything crazy. Uh, if you download, ah, oh, I left the RAR. It's actually an ISO, the Backtrack 4 uh, ISO. Download it, burn it, copy the Casper file into the Backtrack folder on Katana, replace all the files. Basically what happened is the whole uh, file system didn't finish copying over. So that's why everything screwed up. So it is a simple fix but it's just not going to work right off the bat. Again, a uh, thousand apologies. Okay, so going back to the original getting everything to work, um, the reason you might not have seen a lot of these multi-boot systems before is because they're a pain in the butt to get working just off the bat without thumb drives di dying on you. Um, what you need to do is get used to messing with Syslinux uh, or Grub, which are the bootloaders. Um, and then there's the initialization files and that's kind of how I got everything working because you cannot have duplicate directories in the same structure. And that is a fact that everybody here should probably know. So what happens is all the file systems want to load from a certain area so you have to change that area. So you have to figure out how to do that and every single operating system is different. So there, there would be beautiful if there was one like quick fix for everything. But no, I have to analyze every operating system differently. Baseline ones, Ubuntu versus Slacks versus Nopix versus, you know, if they've modified it and, you know, the security distribution that has also made modifications, I have to figure out what those are and changes around. So that's why it's not just a simple straightforward thing that you see posted around uh, a lot. I have to go through and analyze a lot of these files. Um, I put in binary. The first time I started developing, I uh, didn't know that it was a, uh, an image file that I was messing with, which is easy. You just mount it. And I wish I'd known that. I went in with a hex editor and tried to replace things. <laughs> which was not good because the file that I want to change is the same name as like everything. It's called the Casper file and like that word is everywhere. So looking through a hex editor trying to find it took forever and then, you know, that took like two months to look at and then, you know, I read some posts somewhere. They're like, oh, it's just an image file. You mount it. It's like, oh my gosh. Mount it and then, you know, two seconds later everything works. So that's another, you know, that's when you get into building tools like this, the things you have to get through. Um, and that was about a year ago. I guess I should have mentioned I started this project uh, about a year ago, right before uh, DEF CON last year. And the cleanup. 
Uh, I tried to make this, as I said, I wanted to make a dy dynamic environment, people to be able to change and update things as they want. So I tried to clean up the folder structures so you didn't have, I mean, if you look at the Ultimate Boot CD, it's got folders strewn everywhere. It basically looks like the systems folder in Windows. You know, you just get all kinds of stuff. So I made a, a big effort into making things in nice little compact directories. You know, you go into the root of Katana, you see, you know, the backtrack directory or the cane directory, and you say, okay, well, that's where that stuff obviously is. It wasn't that way originally, so I've made a big effort to make it uh, a lot easier for people to uh, modify on their own. So, uh, adding distros. I don't have a ton of time. I am a grad student and I am trying to graduate soon. So I can't <laughs> devote all this time to all the great distros out there. And there are so many out there that it's very difficult. I just try to cover what I can. So I'm going to go through a little bit about how you can add your own distro or you know popular distros that I don't haven't supported yet. Um, how you can go through and make these modifications to add your own. So I'm going to give the example of uh, Samurai, uh, the current version of Samurai. Um, pretty simple in the beginning. Uh, so you just get the ISO, download it, uh, you mount it, or you burn it. However you want to get access to it, and um, save it. Yeah, for this particular one. Uh, yeah, you just make a samurai directory since it's called samurai. Um, in whatever distro name, you kind of insert that there. And then this is the tricky part is figuring out which initialization files to mess with. Um, a, for basically Ubuntu versus Nopix, a lot of those are the same. Uh, I'll, cu I'll cut through this pretty quick because I know this is, this is dry and boring, but I want to keep these in the slides for people to contribute to the project. Um, so yeah, this is just an example of for this particular one, the file structure that needs to be changed. Uh, and then you change the boot menu, adding everything there, and you edit and add some more stuff to the main configuration file for the <coughs> boot menu. And that is long and boring. So I'm just going to show you if this works. <laughs> I, I would be very lucky if I could actually do this. Oops. It's yeah. Okay. There we go. This is what it looks like when you boot up. Same as a lot of other distros if you're used to booting from live stuff. Um, it's here. Most of the stuff works except for the first one, which most people will end up using, so that makes it like the worst possible thing that could have failed. So when you add stuff in here, it'll pop up. You add a new distro, pop up in the menu section. Congratulations, you've got an even cooler tool uh, on you. Okay. Leaving that and going back to the demo. Oh, going back. Okay. So I just went through that boring information about changing the initialization files and right now uh, the only way, before the only way I had it is I posted some forums, some explanations. It's, you know, kind of technical and whatnot. I've created a front, a script front end to make things so much easier. So you don't have to go through all the pain that I've gone through in developing it. Um, all you have to do is select which one you want to install. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm going quick too. But thank you for the applause. Yeah. <laughs> so this should make things a lot easier, and maybe you know, uh, things will work for you guys. So uh, all you have to do you uh, you select which one you want to uh, the distro. Right now I have three different ones working. Uh, you download the ISO, you tell it which directory, and you you hit go install, and it'll you know install for you. It's like Unet Booten. I think a lot of people have probably used that before to install things, except they only install one at a time, and I have to somehow figure out how to you know make all these things work together happily. So right now I have uh, three different ones working: um, Samurai, Weaknet. And something else that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. But uh, hopefully by the full release I'll have at least a dozen is what I'm shooting for. So while you already have, what, ten distributions on there, you can, you know, if you decide I want, you know, the kitchen sink, you can have ten different distributions or I guess at that point, you know, like twenty different distributions on your thumb drive for any kind of response. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, I encourage people to, to look into other ones because I don't have a lot of time um, and then I can add that to this. So your contributions help quite a bit and especially if you're developing a distro and would like to add it here, um, I can, you know, walk people through how to do that for their individual distro. Uh, okay. This is the, was the basic navigation stuff. I just kind of included these slides because I wasn't sure, if, you know, people had done that before. So getting on to the Katana toolkit. So the, the live ISO side a lot of people are used to, the live booting side. 
This not so many people uh, have used um, portable applications. So what portable is is basically it means it doesn't have to install onto your host system. That's not to say it doesn't actually edit some registry or make some other modifications. So I wouldn't say it's 100% forensically sound to run all of these to say, oh, no modifications were made. Um, but you don't have to install them. So they run quick. You've got a whole suite of tools. Um, they, uh, yeah, they'll run in the native environment. Um, uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> this is funny. I, uh, for about two months, my my host uh, operating system was screwed up, so I, I was booting off of uh, Backtrack 3 live, and they didn't have Open Office, and I needed it for class. So I actually ran op portable Open Office through Wine in Backtrack to get Open Office to work easily. And later I found out you can actually add uh, a Slack's um, file to get that done. But at the time, that was a, an interesting way to get through it. So Wine is a Windows emulator for anybody who doesn't know that. And so this portable application was running through there. I ran VLC through it. It worked pretty well. So, you know, some of these applications that I'm talking about on this side, you can actually run in Linux through Wine. Um, but a lot of them are targeting Windows systems, so they're not going to really be too proficient. Uh, the what? Okay, yeah, that's true. That's true. I knew I'd misspeak somehow. Wine is not an emulator, but it will allow you to run Windows files. Are we oh, everybody's kosher with that. Okay. <laughs> so what happens when you speak at DEF CON? You just get called out like that. Um, and the other option is uh, Ultimate Boot CD for Windows. Uh, if anybody has ever messed with that, it's pretty cool. It's not included by default because of Microsoft licensing stuff. Ooh, come on! I didn't get a boo for mentioning Microsoft licensing stuff. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's a portable version of Windows XP-ish. Uh, it's called uh, Windows PE. You know when you install Windows and you have that nice little boot menu and all this stuff's going on, it actually loads this small condensed version of Windows into memory, and that's what controls everything. This extracts it, so it won't run everything beautifully, but it'll run some of the stuff, so you can kind of carry around a portable version of Windows with you, which can be very helpful in certain situations. And configuration and updating. It's very simple to do. Um, I'll show you in a second uh, the structure of everything, but uh, you want to update it, you can update it. It's a USB, so you just have to install it in a certain directory. Bam, it's an updated. You don't have to worry about, you know, waiting a year for the new ISO to come out. Uh, you can update it instantly or add your own files, whatever. So these are kind of the areas I focused on. Um, it's the basic stuff that I feel like anybody would look into security and want and uh, sysadmins, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of tools. Um, I, I, there's things like, uh, well, I guess I'll go to the next slide. These are just a few of the tools that I've got running on there. Um, things like, you know, Siglin <coughs> has a ton of stuff, especially for us Linux people. Um, it's nice to have a portable version of Siglin around because you're like, ah, oh, I have all these cool strips, scripts for, for Linux and then I got to work with these, you know, Windows boxes. What do I do? Siglin on a stick. Very handy. Um, all kinds of other stuff. A lot of these, about half of these are actually new to this edition. So if you're thinking about, oh, okay, well, backtrack screwed up, I don't want to go and get that. Uh, this one, a lot of the new stuff is like um, Nmap and Kane and Metasploit. Uh, and I haven't fully tested Metasploit, but it, it works and it runs, and I haven't seen anybody else, else who actually got it running in Windows on a USB drive. I feel like if I say that in this crowd, somebody would say, I know, but as far as I know, this, this is the uh, only place that um, Metasploit's running in Windows off the flash drive. Um, there's a, all kinds of other tools you might recognize on there. It's pretty convenient. And adding your own applications. In Windows, there's uh, a lot of uh, portable app websites out there. And that's the, those are the ones I've gone through. Um, basically, they just don't have to make registry edits or install things in the system folders or whatever. So uh, some of the smaller tools in the utilities I've actually found that are very common um, that are just you know singular binaries like PuTTY. PuTTY is a perfect example. You know when you install PuTTY you don't even like you don't get the nice little icons. It doesn't install. It just says extract me somewhere because I'll run anywhere. So that's a good example of a portable application and something like that is included on here. Uh, but there's a lot more. Linux, um, you can make static binaries uh, if you want to try that. Um, will that work 100% of the time? Probably not. Uh, have I tested it a lot? Absolutely not. Um, but it is possible. Yes. 
for the Windows side or the back the, the Linux side? Uh, I believe so. I, I mean, it loads everything in, but uh, that's another thing. That's the 64-bit. Sorry, he asked if there's a um, way to differentiate between 32-bit and 64-bit in Linux, um, and that's actually an issue with a lot of these things that people. I've been, I've tested this on a 32-bit machine. Um, some of these tools have 64-bit. Uh, counterparts that will do the same thing. Uh, I developed this for 32 bit. A lot of times if you see a tool and it's not running you can try to look it up. Uh, that's one other thing I didn't put in the slides. I have a crap ton of documentation. Uh, that's one thing that I found that was difficult when learning uh, new distributions was like okay, sweet I have these tools. What does that do? Uh, the only description I have is a name or something I've read. So the documentation for Katana actually has a brief summary of every single portable application out there, hence time consumption. Um, and then a brief uh, description of the distributions, but not all their tools, because I'm not, I'm not crazy. Uh, so a lot of them will give you the websites. So if it doesn't work 32 bit, you can go and get the 64 bit version. Uh, and as far as the Linux goes, I, I, I know that you can do this, I haven't tested it. I know that like the UNET bootin uh, for, win for Linux is a static binary. Uh, you can get the source but it will just run. So you have to I'd tinker around with it. I don't know from distro to distro but it is possible. So you could carry things, trusted applications around with you on your thumb drive without um, having to uh, uh, you know, trust the host operating system. OS X, I don't know, whoever you'll get a Mac. I have no experience with Macs whatsoever. Um, if people know how to add portable applications to Macs, that would be awesome. I'd totally be into that uh, for, for you Mac people out there. But um, that's just not anything I've explored so far. So uh, Wakasashi. Uh, so Katana is a sword. Wakasashi is a smaller sword. Theme. Um, forge is a forge. So yeah, I've stuck with a little bit of a theme here. Uh, USB write blocker. This is um, pretty handy. So I've tested it a little bit. So the reason I included this uh, or I've been working on this is uh, malware, I don't know if you guys know this, but malware is now targeting USB drives. You, you, you might have been aware of this. You might have seen this in your environment. You might have come to DEF CON talks and heard about this. It's live. It's, in, it's native and it's a beautiful way to transmit malware because Everybody's you know so concerned about it. Uh, is, you know my Firefox is up to date. Do I have you know no script? Do I have all these security features in place? And then USB drive, they just hop right on there, and then you know you never know the wiser. So um, while a lot of these things on there will be definitely flagged by antivirus, uh, this Metasploit is on the stick. The antivirus just explodes when you stick this in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and almost, uh, almost everything, at least half the things on there, it just hacker tool, hacker tool. Like the, I couldn't even scroll down fast enough. It just kept shooting up. Um, so that's another warning. Uh, if you're going to mess with this, your antivirus is going to just throw a hissy fit. It's going to go crazy. So you might want to disable it before mounting this. Or don't, sometimes it doesn't auto run. You know, if it won't auto run and scan the device, sometimes you're okay. But the first time you click on something, it, you know, tries to get at it. So two reasons that I have the write blocker. One is for malware so it doesn't get on the drive and you're not transmitting that everywhere. And the other one is to prevent those pesky antiviruses from deleting all of the awesome stuff that's on here. Um, I tested it. It worked. I'm sure because I announced this at DEF CON. Next week they're going to be able to figure out how to delete my tools from Katana. But for now, <laughs> as of like today, this works preventing anything from accessing it problem side, a lot of these tools do want to write stuff to their directory. So some of them might not work in this way and you can't store your information there. Um, yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, there's another thing. Uh, the Wakasashi is very tiny. Um, sorry, I was going to just. I recommend not putting it on a flash drive because that's kind of not the point. If you put it on a flash drive to run and prevent the other one, well, congratulations, the one you just put in got infected. So uh, that doesn't help anything. I recommend, you know, like the, the business card size, and this isn't quite right, but the, the really small CDs, some you can keep in your back pocket, business card ones, it's, it's like a couple K, if that. So you can easily keep it on something else, um, a medium that's not going to be infected by malware. Uh, it's very simple to use, and I think right now, yeah, I'll try to bring up my live demo. We check something else real quick. Um, yeah, I did get that in a minute, but uh, it's uh, I have an eight gig, um, mostly because I like the idea of uh, 
being able to add a lot. Actually, I developed on a, on a 16 gig. Uh, it takes four. You can put it on a four gig. Um, it's not gonna throw a hissy fit, and yeah. So I'd say I suggest 16. They're dirt cheap now. Um, and of course, more epic fail. It won't move to the other window. All right. So I now officially hate Compass Barrel or Compass Fusion. I used to love it because it makes you do. You can do cool little things like twirling desktops and wobbly windows, and it's great. And now that it has destroyed my presentation at DEF CON. I'm officially uh, against it. I probably, if there's anybody on the Compass Fusion team here, this is a problem. It's a serious problem. <laughs> you guys need to fix that stuff, all right? I'll find you. <laughs> okay, well, so um, that live demo, I can't. Windows gets stuck on this one and won't go up there. What in the world? All, right, all you Linux uh, naysayers, congratulations, you now have more fuel for the fire. Um, all right. Well, it's it's pretty simple. Sorry, it's not up there. You click, you run the Wakasashi. You hit yes, and it makes it uh, read only. You hit no, it makes it read writable. Um, when you want to mount something, you, it, re it edits a registry value. So you you change it, and then you mount it, and then you can unchange. It doesn't matter. It's only at the point of mount that things make a difference. So. Don't, you know, you can unmount it and you really want to change it back because if you're on a user's computer and, you know, they're trying to plug in their iPod and it's not running and they're going to find you and, you know, that's obviously the more, most important thing on their computer is that they can sync to iTunes. So if you went in and had to, you know, remove some virus, that's really not as important to them as being able to sync to iTunes. So you really want to undo what you do uh, when you make it read only. So. It sticks up there. Uh, no live demo. Great. Um, Katana is available at the Hackers for Charity booth right now. Um, the older versions are available on my website. So here's the, the 4 gig. Uh, the new one, I, I'm still in debate about adding some other uh, live uh, distributions, but for now it's about 4 gig, so you can run on a 4 gig drive. Um, it's a RAR file. I think I get to that in a second. Yes, it's a RAR file. I have so many people ask me, why can't I burn this to DVD? It's because it's not, it's not supposed to be burned to DVD. It's a RAR file. You extract it. Um, it is on DVD there, but in RAR format. So you extract it, you run it. it the instructions are on there. I just thought I would put that out there because people come up to me all the time or send me emails and stuff and say, I can't get this to work. You extract it into the root of the flash drive. If you extract it into a subfolder, it's not going to work either. So those are the two biggest things, problems that I get all the time. Um, yeah, I think that's most of it. That's just the instructions there. You can create an ISO. This is new for this version as well. There's a couple new things. Uh, the Forge one is new. This is new. Um, it works okay. Uh, some of the live distributions change a lot of things around between USB and CD versions. So uh, while it will make, it's really nifty if you want to hand it out to a lot of people. Uh, you can create, not, you know, you can create the portable application stuff. You can configure it any way you want, add, remove, whatever. Uh, hand it out to all the people you work with, and then you have all these tools on there. So a live ISO option is really good. Some of the th applications, or some of the live ISOs will boot, or some of the, sorry, the portable um, distributions will boot. Uh, by the time this is full release, I hope to have them all working. Right now it's just some of them working. But that is the final plan is to make the ISO exactly the same as the uh, USB version. So tips and tricks. Um, since you're working in a live environment, uh, scripting is awesome. Um, uh, you know, the, the one beautiful thing about live is, and I know this is why I really enjoy it, uh, I s screw things up sometimes that might have come across already. Uh, and so it's nice to be able to boot into, you know, a live distribution, do whatever you want, absolutely, you know, anger the kernel and, uh, and then you just reboot and everything is magically back where it was. So that's, you know, one of the great parts of an ISO. But the other flip to that is modifications can be tricky unless you do persistent. Um, I'm not going to talk about that much here, but look into persistent mode. You can actually save things on the system. So if you do want to update backtrack, you want to update Ubuntu, you can. If you boot into persistent mode, it will store it there. Everything should work fine. But if you, like me, enjoy the live environment and being able to mess around with things and not having fear of screwing stuff up, uh, scripting is awesome. This is just a couple of, of URLs um, for 
uh, portable applications that you can look into. As I said, I didn't include all of them. There's a lot of them in there. They're actually, I did find this one website for OSX stuff, but it's like the really high end uh, um, open source applications like OpenOffice, so there wasn't really any security stuff. Uh, yeah, so this is my beg and plea. Uh, I only have so much time. I'm basically the only dev on this entire thing, so, and I'm a grad student, so I really just don't have tons of time to uh, work on this. So if you want to help by recommendations are welcome. Um, if you want to recommend tools, that would be awesome. If you want to, especially if you want to work on scripts to add distributions, thank you so much because that, that's the most time consuming thing I'm sure that I ever work on. Um, if you have tools that you are writing that run portably, let me know. I'll check into it. Um, yeah, I mean, a, anything you can do to help out. I have a forum, post everything on there. Uh, I'll get Q&A in just like two seconds. Is that cool? Okay. Actually, I think that's the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was good, good timing. You were, you were right on about that. So, again, uh, the pre-release is at the Hackers for Charity booth. Um, it, you can get it fully working. There is a lot of new stuff on this version. Um, I know none of this was actually like, this is how you hack into this thing. But I did provide a whole lot of tools um, and some documentation so if you're starting off the bat, this is a great thing to mess around with. And uh, yeah, if the, if the HFC guys want to come up real quick, um, we're going to have some uh, free t-shirts. Anybody raise a hand? Hacks for Charity t-shirt? You guys want to come up? Yeah. Uh, raise your hand if this presentation was awesome. Yay! All right. I had to catch you when you're off guard. <laughs> All right. So, so while everybody's looking around, the Hacks for Charity booth is again on the other side of these walls, all the way in the back. Come check it out. If the T-shirts don't fit, we'll swap it out for you. You got the. Uh, All right, my last thing before I'm going to do a little bit of Q&A. We are doing some auctions there. We got some really cool stuff signed by a lot of cool people. We're auctioning off stuff like this. Um, come, it's all for charity. Uh, we're asking for any kind of donations you want to give, but these are uh, bidding on. We've got a lot of stuff on there that's really cool. Some, of course, one of the one of the kind items. Uh, so yeah, check it out. Um, I guess I have a minute for Q&A or five for Q&A. Um, but I'll probably head over there after I answer this question. So if you want to get the new version and want to talk to me, I'll be over there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Looked into what? I'm oh, sorry. So the problem, the difficulty, he was asking about, um, he said he loses thumb drives all the time and uh, was wondering about encrypting a thumb drive. It, yes, you can. The problem is the, it depends on your environment. If you're Windows only, you can say, hey, you can slap TrueCrypt on there, encrypt it, and that's great. But if you want to go to the Windows side or OSX side, then, you know, you have to get that software working and unencrypting it the same way. So because it's portable, that presents a problem. So yes, you could encrypt a hard drive, or a thumb drive just like a hard drive, but because the idea with this is that you can run it on all these different platforms, that makes it a little more difficult. Yes? I don't know about, uh, since that's the bootloader system, I think that modify, uh, it might work on there, I'm not positive. But you have to, you have to run that through Windows as far as I know. He was asking about the TrueCrypt bootloader and that, that might be an option. I've never looked into that. So then you could have it in the bootloader, encrypt it and then unencrypt it uh, at runtime. But then again, you have to, if you're considering the portable application side of things, you have to unencrypt the whole thing. So since it's both, it would be great. If you guys want to look into that, I think that would be an awesome option. Um, yeah. Well. For the, uh, uh, drive locker? Yeah. Um, is it scriptable so like you can say tell it on through command line? It's not right now but that's a good option. This is basically we just finished this and I've it's really prototype testing but that's good. It's actually it's a visual basic script. Um, so you can modify it any way you want and it'll run on any system. The 32 versus 64 bit whatever it's a visual basic script. Uh, 
yeah. What I have for the actually the Katana portable pops up as the auto run. Um, so it, the, like the portal applications, if you sit yes to the auto run, that pops up first. Um, I could maybe look into adding that, but yeah, that's a good point. If I could get that running in the auto run, it'd probably make more people more conscious. Yeah. Yeah, the, that's a good point. He said he, you can run the auto run and it will work before the drive is running, but I don't know. I don't trust that in, as much as once it's physically in, I just consider malware able to access it. So, you know, I, it might be good, but it might not be the absolute perfect way for doing it. But it is an option. You could do that the first thing off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. And there are actually USB write blocking hardware that you can buy that's not like $100. It's not terribly expensive. The SD ones? So it, it makes it read only? Oh, okay. He was, the gentleman here was saying that uh, there are SD card ones and this should run off of any flash disk, hard drive, whatever. You can install it to your base system if you want. Everything should work there. But uh, you can buy SD card reader write blockers that for like 30 bucks. So I didn't know that. that that's pretty good. Is it really? Oh, yeah, that might be a good option. If the, if, so if you can get a USB adapter for it, for the USB, for a write blocker, for uh, the SD cards, if you get a USB adapter, then makes it more universal. So, yeah, that seems like a cool option. All right, I think I'm going to head over to the uh, HFC booth. If you guys have more questions, you want to get the pre release, um, we'll see you there.